But while I was away last week, Pastor Cody continued our sermon series, God Is. And he shared a message that God is just. And if you missed the message, can I encourage you to go to our website or over to the YouTubes and check it out. He mentioned that God is one who judges fairly. And if he is the one who is going to be judging, if he is the one who is the judge, then we don't need to be. We don't need to be the ones responsible for determining what's right, what's wrong, who's in, who's out. That that's, that's God's job. Our job is to love. Uh, great message. If you, if you missed it, please go check it out. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at this idea of God is and then filling in the blank. We've been taking various attributes or characteristics of God and attempt to paint a more accurate picture of the God that we serve. I find that many of us focus on certain attributes of God that seem to fit with our lifestyle or the way that we uh, envision the way God works. And sometimes God is bigger than those ways that we tend to look at him. I've appreciated how many of you have engaged with this series through the chalkboard in the foyer, uh, adding your one-word description of God, filling in the blank. Because there's ones that are there that I never would have thought to write down. Uh, Colorful was one that I was like, oh, that's a really cool picture. Filling in the blank. God is blank. We began with the recognition that no one word is fully going to capture the mystery and the majesty of this ultimate reality, that all of our words fail, and at best we can get a fuzzy approximation of God is like, or God is holy, but he's also just, he's also loving, he's near to us, and yet he's everywhere. That there's a whole bunch of these pictures that, when put together, maybe give us a better understanding. When we step back and look at the big picture. With each word we look at, we're building on the last one in an attempt to give us a little clearer understanding of this mystery that, as somebody wrote back there, can be quite confusing at times. These fuzzy approximations don't often give us a clear picture. God is love, yes, but he is also just. He is merciful and he is holy. He is all-powerful, yet he's intimate and close. Fuzzy pictures, indeed. It's much like those Magic Eye posters. I don't know if you remember seeing these a few years ago. I will confess, I've never seen anything in one of these before (laughs) until we were doing it in the office. I was asking whether or not it's because I'm colorblind that I couldn't see them, and so I was asking uh, the staff and summer students to, like, try with the iPad. And so this one we were looking at and you have to like pull it right up to your face and kind of go cross-eyed and then like slowly back it away and kind of not focus and as you do pictures kind of pop out of the screen Uh, so you might see a sailboat uh, or a a schooner a schooner is a sailboat Um, you you have to kind of unfocus a little bit so this is sort of what it's like when we when we get really close and we look at a specific attribute of God maybe we don't see the picture until we kind of back away a little bit and things become a little bit more clear maybe a better example is to think of it more like a mosaic. So a mosaic is a whole bunch of little pictures that when looked at really closely, you see these are pictures of a bunch of individual faces. But if we were to zoom out, the picture looks more like Jesus. This is what we're attempting to do with each one of these attributes of God. A a tiny little picture that hopefully when we put it all together gives us a larger image. To wrap our minds around the idea that God is good and eternal, that he is just and he is merciful. And that's where we're going to be headed this morning. That God is merciful. What is mercy? Mercy, some have defined mercy as compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone who is within one's power to punish or harm. It's within my power to dole out judgment and punishment. So for mercy's sake, I withhold that punishment. To show compassion and forgiveness towards someone that I have power over. It's, it's not treating people the way that they perhaps deserve to be treated. Maybe they've earned the right to be punished. Justice might say an eye for an eye, but mercy withholds the punishment. And this message kind of dovetails with Cody's message last week where he talked about God being just, that God will take care of things fairly. That he is going to judge and treat people fairly. That ultimately it's up to him to decide what they deserve. They will be treated fairly, but 
The fact is he's also merciful, so what he thinks is fair and what we think is fair might look very different. We're going to get to that in a second. God is merciful. There are a few poignant references in the Old Testament where God is referred to as merciful or where the children of God call out to this God of mercy. In Genesis 19, uh, the scripture says that God was merciful to Lot and his family as they escaped Sodom and Gomorrah. That God showed mercy on that family by not allowing them to fall under the same punishment of those who were in Sodom and Gomorrah. Deuteronomy 4.31 says, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by oath. He's a merciful God. Nehemiah describes him as the merciful God. David does periodically throughout the Psalms. Daniel refers to him as the God of all mercy. There are countless cries for mercy found in the Old Testament. They hint at the truth that he is indeed merciful. Wherever you see the word mercy, it might not say specifically God is merciful or God is mercy, but the fact that we could call out to him and ask for mercy says that there is a chance that he actually is merciful. Because if God was just a vengeful, angry God, and we knew that about him, why would we bother to ask for mercy? If you knew that his character was to only dole out punishment, there would be no point in asking for mercy. And yet, the book of Psalms is riddled with references for God to show mercy to his people. If God were not merciful, people wouldn't bother to ask for mercy because God is indeed merciful. And as wonderful and as frequent as those references to mercy in the Old Testament are this morning, I want to take us into the New Testament. I want to focus on some of the words of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Um, these are the, the words of Jesus. There are uh, crowds have gathered around and he is, he is teaching about loving your enemies. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 36 is what we're going to be spending some time in this morning. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Uh, does anybody else wish this was not in the Bible? <laughs> like when we read that, do you go like, Ooh, oh, ow. Sometimes the words of Jesus really bug me. And I had a friend who told me that the pages of his uh, Bible were perforated so that when he came across those passages that he found difficult to understand or just didn't really want to, uh, you know, have to live by, he would just tear that page out and move on to the next one that made him feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, when I asked him last, he said that he was down to three pages of scripture that he understood and didn't make him uncomfortable. I think they were the leg genealogies and that's about it. <laughs> Let's break this down a bit. God is merciful. And Jesus is teaching to these people who've gathered around. And this is Luke's recounting of the Sermon on the Mount. If you're familiar with the, the probably the most famous uh, sermon recorded of Jesus, it's one of the greatest pieces of English literature, actually, to break down Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And this is Luke's version. The, the big one, the uh, director's cut, the extended edition, is found in Matthew. Uh, if you go back to Matthew 5, you can get the whole meal deal there, but Luke gives us kind of an abbreviated form, the Coles Notes version of the Sermon on the Mount, and especially on Jesus' teaching about loving your enemies. In Matthew's version, Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So that's the, the context. You've heard it was said that the, the common teaching of the day was, you need to love your neighbor, yes, but 
Go ahead and hate your enemy. But Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Luke's version says, if you, yeah, if you are listening, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Like I said, the common teaching of the day was to, to look after your neighbor because that, was, that wasn't just Jesus' idea. This was found in the Old Testament back in Deuteronomy. It was God's command that we would love our neighbor, that we were to love God and love our neighbor. Jesus wasn't bringing out a new teaching when he suggested that those were the greatest commandments. But the, the people of Israel had done really well at looking after their neighbors, those who were like them, those who believed the same thing they did, those who were part of the chosen ones of God. But when it came to their enemies, they didn't do a great job of reaching out to them. So the common teaching was, yes, look after your neighbors, those who are like you, those who are close to you, care for them, but hate your enemies, those who are outside the gates, those who are far from you. Sounds a little bit like the foreign policy of some nations, the way the world still kind of works. We haven't uh, evolved all that much from Jesus' day when it comes to looking after our own, but not caring for the ones who are not like us. But Jesus turns all of that on its head. The way the kingdom is that way, it seems to be this upside-down kingdom. What we think is right uh, might be wrong. What we think is up might be down. And Jesus flips this on its head. He says, love your neighbor, but love your enemy as well. When hate comes your way, I want you to respond with love, he says. Hate never beats hate. Hate only breeds more hate. Uh, I saw a video clip. I will give you a warning if you do decide to Google it later. Jim Jeffries, he's a comedian. There's lots of language in it that would be offensive to some, but there's one part in the video where he talks about hate never conquers hate. Only love can conquer hate. And so he said, if somebody comes at you and they hate you, choose love. They might still hate you. They might never come to the place where they get to uh, appreciate you. But if you choose love, everyone else will recognize who the bad guy in the situation is. And he didn't use the word bad guy, but who the bad guy in the situation is. So he said, don't be the bad guy. Choose love. Always choose love. Because hate will never beat hate. We have fought hate with hate for centuries. And it's not working. Hate will never triumph over hate. Only love can beat it. So Jesus says, when people hate you, do good to them. Love them. When they curse you, bless them. It doesn't say defend yourself. It doesn't say stand up for your rights. It doesn't say fight back. It says love, bless, and pray for them. Now, I don't know about you, but these aren't easy words for me to hear. Because my first reaction is to, to, to defend myself. My first reaction is to stand up for what I believe is right. I'm not going to let you walk all over me. But Jesus says, when they, bless, or when they curse you, bless them. These are really hard words to live by, but I wonder what the world would look like. What a difference it would make if we didn't treat people the way they deserve to be treated, but we treated them the way that God has called us to treat them. With greater love than they deserve. With greater grace, with greater mercy. What if we showed people that kind of mercy because God is merciful and has been merciful to us. Now in case we're a little fuzzy on what it looks like for us to show mercy and to extend that to others... Jesus spells it out a little bit. He gives us a few examples. He says, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Good luck with that. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. That doesn't sound like a <laughs> great plan. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. So let's just for a second, let's assume Jesus is means what he says. Let's assume for a second that this is like, he's not just like, well, supposing this happens. Let's say you actually have a, a situation where you end up in a fender bender. What do you do when somebody hits you and do you fly off the handle? Do you start screaming at them? Do you, where were you going? What were you doing? Do you defend yourself? I was in the right, you were in the wrong. What do you do when it comes to somebody slapping you on one cheek, do you turn the other to them also? 
I'm okay a little bit with the like giving to those who have or who are in need and maybe not expecting anything in return to be able to be generous. But if they just take from me, I'm not supposed to demand it back. Perhaps it's easier for us to wrap our minds around this if we take a look at the way God has treated us. Because we've done exactly those things. We have slapped his grace. We have said that we can do it on our own, that we don't need him, that we have taken from him without recognizing what he has done in our lives. We may in our lives have even cursed God, and yet he still extends mercy. I wonder what the world would look like. This is pretty radical teaching to think about if Jesus really meant what he says. Could anybody actually live like that? That the way of the kingdom is service, it's giving up our rights and privileges to reveal Jesus to other. if others. If someone slaps us, we turn the other cheek. We give even when it costs us. It says, do unto others as you would have do unto them do unto you. Now, my dad didn't go to church, but he sure liked this passage. Um, anytime us boys would get fighting or call names or, or hit one another, I would hear this, I would hear this phrase uh, from mom and dad. I would hear the, like, the golden rule. We grew up with the golden rule. Do unto others, if you don't want him to steal your toys, then you don't steal his toys. And there's truth in that idea of like, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But we often paint it in this like, negative light. If you don't want them to do this, well then you don't do this. If you don't want them to hurt you, then you don't hurt them. But the way Jesus paints this picture is, you want mercy. So you show mercy. You want grace, then you give grace. You want love, then you give love. It's not just a matter of withholding punishment. It's this idea of extending grace and mercy. Jesus goes on to say that if we only love those who are like us, if we only love those who do good to us, what credit is that to us? How does that reveal the kingdom? Everybody can do that. Everybody can treat everyone else with exactly equal sort of grounds, for the most part, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But there's something about the way of the kingdom that causes and calls us to something greater. That the way of the kingdom is to, when somebody slaps you on the one cheek, you turn the other also. When someone takes from you, you don't demand it back. You don't defend your rights. You allow God to be the one who judges. You allow God to be the one who is just. And these are really challenging words, and you might end up in situations where you do need to be the one who just stands firm, and you don't let people walk all over you. And please don't hear me saying that they're in every situation you just let people take advantage of you. But there are times where we have been really quick to defend what's mine and forgotten that none of it is ours in the first place. When I think of wanting mercy the way that I covet the mercy of God, the way that I am so desperate for the mercy of God, and I think of extending that to others, I always think of Romans chapter 5. I had to memorize it in Bible college. And in 5 verses 6 and 8, Paul writes, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God showed us mercy when we were his enemy. Uh, the picture I always have of my life before God was standing outside of the kingdom and, and uh, it, it was as if there was this crystal castle that I knew God was, was in, that, um, that he was the one who had created everything and had ruled over everything, but I was somehow outside of his love. I was somehow outside of his care. If he had created this whole world, he didn't really care much about me. And so I stood outside of that, and I chucked rocks at the, at the castle. 
And I said, you don't give a rip about me. And I chucked rocks claiming that God had abandoned and did not care. I sat out there powerless to do anything about my life. And in that moment, Christ died for me. While I was still sinners, while I was still chucking rocks at the castle, Christ died for me. This is mercy. That God gave up his life for those who did not deserve it. None of us deserve his mercy. None of us have earned it. None of us deserve to have the forgiveness that he has so richly lavished on us. So when you see the person across the street who you know also doesn't deserve that mercy because of the choices they've made in their lives, Jesus died for them too. And the call for us is to be merciful just as our Father is merciful. I don't know if you find these words challenging. I don't know if you want to rip them out of your scripture because I know that I fall so short of this example of God. But can I encourage you this morning? God never falls short. We do. We fail. We stumble. We are in our attempts to be his disciples, in our attempts to love the way Jesus loves. We get it wrong 60% of the time. We get it wrong all the time. But God never does. God never falls short. His mercies are new every morning. God is merciful. So even if you fall short, you can call out to him and that mercy is extended to you. Here's a thought that I've been processing all this week. Each one of these attributes, these characteristics that we've been looking at, they, they not only describe God, they're not just a something that we attach to God, if that makes sense. It's, it's not just the way that God acts. Um, you could say that I, I'm a generous person because I give my time to, to help those who are in need. Well, I might be a generous person, but I might, I might just be doing generous things. Do you see how those two things are different? That the way we act versus who we are might not line up perfectly. But when we look at God, that's not the case. That the characteristics, the attributes that we're discussing are part of his very nature. So it's not just the way that God, God doesn't just act mercifully towards us. God doesn't just choose to be merciful. He is mercy. He, his very nature is to be merciful. It is who he is. He is good. He is just. These are not just qualities or things that he does. It's who he is. So the thing I've been processing through this week is, if that's true, if these attributes are actually part of the very fabric of who God this mystery is, then that means each one of these attributes existed before you and I did. That each one of these attributes also existed before the fall of man. That each one of these attributes existed before creation. Because before all of that, God was. And so... Before anything came into being, mercy existed. And even if all of this gets stripped away, mercy will still exist. There is no beginning or end to the mercy of God. There is no beginning or end to the goodness of God because it is in his very nature to be good, to be merciful. Does that make sense? A little existential crisis going on there. Mercy existed before we fell and turned away from our Creator. So you will never outrun the mercy of God. When we sang those lines in that last song, wander or come home, you're not too far. You've never gone so far as to be away from the mercy of God. There is nothing that you can do. There is no where that you can run that would keep you from the mercy of God. He is eternal, so his mercy is also eternal. So the mercy that is available to you today is the same mercy that Jesus went to the cross to provide. It's the same mercy that was revealed, not provided, revealed in the cross. That mercy existed before the cross happened. It existed before the creation of the world. So if you're in need of mercy today, it's available for you. 
If you are in short supply of the mercy that you show to other people, it's available for you that there's an unlimited supply. Remember that you were once a rebel. You were once an enemy of God and he showed you mercy. What would it look like for you to show mercy to others? For God is merciful. I'm really grateful that God withholds the punishment that is due me. We'll probably talk about grace where he not only withholds the punishment, but he also lavishes his love upon us in a few weeks. But I don't deserve this life. I don't deserve to be forgiven. I don't deserve to have a relationship with my Creator. I've done nothing to earn it. Were it not for His mercy, were it not for this incredible compassion that He has, I don't know where I would be today. It's His kindness that leads us to repentance. It's His mercy that causes us to bend our knee. Because God is merciful. So, for your neighbor that you have a tough time showing love to, I say to you, God is merciful. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. For your family member who drives you absolutely crazy, I say to you, God is merciful. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. For the person in your life whose choices have made your life more difficult, I say to you, God is merciful. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. For the people who believe in a different way of life than you do, I say to you, God is merciful. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. For the one who's in your face with arguments and hate, I say to you, God is merciful. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. For your own sin, for your own shame, I say to you this morning, God is merciful. Thanks be to God that this is true, because I am in desperate need of His mercy today. A.W. Tozer writes, To receive mercy, we must first know that God is merciful. And it's not enough to believe that he once showed mercy to Noah or Abraham or David and will again show mercy in some happy future day. We must believe that God's mercy is boundless, free, and through Jesus Christ our Lord, available to us now in our present situation. My prayer for each one of us is that we would know in our heart of hearts that God is merciful and that we would call on and fall on that mercy, that we would revel in it and we would treasure it, but we wouldn't take it for granted. We would recognize the incredible gift that it is and what cost it came to us and that we would not only let this mercy be ours, but we would extend it to the world that doesn't understand the mercy of God. There's something shocking about turning the other cheek. There is something shocking about not standing up and fighting for what's mine. The way of the kingdom is mercy. It's mercy that will draw people to his very heart. For God is merciful. Let's pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I am so indebted to your mercy this morning, Lord. I am so overwhelmed that it never runs out, that it never comes up short, that it never cuts me off. You've never reached a place with me that you've just decided enough is enough, I'm done. But you continue to turn the other cheek. You continue to to bless even when I trample all over that mercy. And this morning I ask for your forgiveness for taking your mercy for granted. For those times where I've just 
I've known that the mercy is there, and so I just carry on in my stupidity and my self-reliance and I carry on in my own sin. Uh, uh, forgive me, Lord, for, for not recognizing the, the incredible gift that this mercy is and, and, and what it costs for you to extend it to each one of us. And Lord, forgive me when I have failed to show it to others because you've so richly lavished your mercy upon me. You've forgiven me for so much. And yet I hang on to little things and I refuse to extend mercy. Forgive me, God. Forgive me when I have fallen short. I pray that each one of us would experience your mercy in this place. For those who have come, whose uh, hearts are weighed down with sin, who are caught up in stuff that is dragging them down, I pray that your mercy would overwhelm them this morning, that you would bring freedom and forgiveness, redemption and release, and that you would allow them to take a deep breath of fresh, free air. And Lord, I pray that we would extend that mercy that's been given to us, to others. Freely have we received. Let us freely give. Lord, in your mercy, you do not treat us the way our sins deserve. But while we were powerless, while we were still your enemies, you died for us. Help us to live in such a way that reveals your mercy in the world around us. In the same way that these characteristics and attributes aren't just something that you do, it's who you are. Help us to be people of mercy. Not just people who act mercifully, but people who are merciful. That we might reflect your image in clearer ways in the world around us. Help us when it's really hard to do. When those who come at us with hate, when those who... Um, who would curse us, help us to turn around and bless. Help us to overcome hatred with love. Because we recognize we can't do it on our own. But there is an abundant supply in you. So we lean on you and we call out to you that you might show mercy to us. Lord, my heart echoes the prayer of David in Psalm 103 this morning. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise your holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He's made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. For the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse. He will not harbor his anger for us. He will not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And his righteousness with their children's children and those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all you heavenly hosts and his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in this dominion. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. We bless you this morning, merciful one. 
ask you to help us to be merciful as you are merciful. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. Be kind. Show mercy to those you come in contact with today. And may God's blessing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be, be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. See you next Sunday. Thank you.